we, we always take this time during Sukkot, during the Feast of Tabernacles, to, uh, to, to spend some time in a Bible study. And this isn't like a, uh, this isn't like a, like a three-point sermon and an altar call kind of situation. This is usually um, like us having a conversation and we study through a particular topic together, more of an intimate kind of let's geek out together over one particular topic over the Bible. And um, I really enjoy that. That's kind of my bread and butter is, is teaching and, and having this kind of intimate conversation with you guys. So if at any point you have a question or you want to chime in something, just throw your hand up. I, I more than likely won't have the answer to it, but maybe someone else will. But um, this, this year, we're studying through the book of Mark. And last year, we studied through the sect known as The Way, the history of our movement. And uh, you may remember that I took you through the different slides and showed you the history of, of this sect known as The Way, or Christianity, as it's called as well, um, as also called the Nazarenes. And then we did, a, we did a tour of the temple in Jerusalem as it stood in the first century. We did a virtual tour. Um, well, anyways, tonight we're going to go through Mark. And kind of the essential question I'm going to try to answer tonight is why are we looking at Mark this year during Sukkot? Why not like something like, you know, the rapture or with the second coming of, of Yeshua or, you know, some of these juicier, more elaborate topics that we like to get hung up on sometimes. But we're looking at Mark because there's some simple truths and fundamental truths and, and applications we can take from the Gospel of Mark. But more than anything, I'm teaching on the book of Acts leading up, um, uh, probably starting next month, mid-next month, I'll be starting on Acts. And I thought, you know what, it'd be a shame if I didn't teach, if I taught on Acts, but I didn't teach through one of the Gospels. And there's kids, like even 12, 13 years old in our midst right now, who have never really heard a good, meaty study on one of the Gospels before. And they're growing up, in, and that's a shame that, that we haven't done that and led them through that. Going through the tour portions every year is really good and really important, and trying to weave in the elements of the Gospel into the Torah portions is really good, but sometimes it's hard to really get, give a, a good, cohesive story of a narrative of the life and the ministry and the death and the burial and resurrection of Yeshua of Nazareth without just going and like digging into one of the Gospels. So why Mark before we go into Acts? Well, really, there's nothing super fancy about it. It's just the shortest Gospel, okay? It's, it's the oldest gospel. It's 16 chapters long. And I figured, you know what? If we're going to go through a gospel together, let's go through the oldest and the shortest, and then we'll get into Acts. So we'll kind of lay a foundation of what was this Yeshua all about? What did he come to do? What are some of the things that he did? And then what did his followers go and do? What were the acts of his followers? That's why we call that book the Acts of the Apostles, okay? So are you guys ready for the... For, for the uh, the journey through Acts this week? Yep. Good. Thank you, Anna. Um, <laughs> now, I'm not going to be the only one teaching on, I'm sorry, the book of Mark this week. I'm not going to be, te- be teaching on Mark all week long. Um, you're going to get you're gonna a lesson from uh, Jeremy. You're going to get a lesson from Patrick. And you're going to get a lesson from Anthony in addition to myself, okay? So they've been studying through their portions of Mark. We parsed it up and we divided it into those sections. And then they're going to come up and teach on their section of Mark as well and kind of do more of a, like an intimate Bible study as well, okay? So I'm really glad that we have young folks here and they're, they're hearing some of these things for the first time in their entire lives. But um, you guys tell me, I always like to access prior knowledge before I go into something. What do you know about the book of Mark? Now, I've already thrown some facts out there, but what do you know so far about the book of Mark? Throw your hand up. Jeremy, I don't know if I can call on you. Yeah, <laughs> All right, let me, let me hold Jeremy for reserve in case nobody else knows anything about Mark, okay? Mom, I saw your hand up. 1045. What? Mark 1045, isn't that the key verse? What does it say? Yeah. Um, yeah. And Mark 10 is an important, that's a dividing line between something we're going to talk about as well. So, yeah, he came, he came to seek and save that which was lost. Anybody else know anything about Mark? Well, over there, I see somebody's hand. Suzanne, is that you? Yeah. Um, so it's a very action-oriented book. Yeah. Uh, much more condensed than some of the other gospels in that respect. And um, Mark is using the miracles of 
Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It is an action-packed little book with 16 chapters. Let me ask one of the one of the young folks sitting back there on the on the table. Um how many gospels are there that we have in our canon? I see a hand up. Who is that? Four. Four. Correct. Now let me tell a story and talk to you about why that's important, okay? Now, uh is my father in law Gene here? Or is it Is he under the tent? Okay, good. It's good that he's not here. I can tell a story then. So yeah. <laughs> My father-in-law, he, he grew up on the Tampa Bay. I'm talking like his backyard was the Tampa Bay, all right? Now, back then, it, and don't think like high-rise condominiums and all that stuff like it is many parts in the Tampa Bay now, but rather think like palmetto, mangrove swamps, um, very marshy beaches, and, and just kind of like this old Florida before humanity kind of took over and bulldozed everything, okay? And he was like this one house with with miles of this palmetto mangrove beach like tidal tidal um beach on 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 either side of his house miles of that okay nothing on either side and he grew up in that so at night you can picture being out there on the tampa bay at night it's like quiet and serene and then suddenly you hear the roar of the engine the a dual engine airplane and it is swooping down low over your house. And it's out there. It's, it's the middle of the night. No one lives within, you know, like a couple miles on either side of you on the Tampa Bay. And that plane swoops down over your house. And you run to your bedroom and you look out. And you see it swoop down over the water just outside your house. And then you hear a kaprash, a huge splash in the water. And then you sit there and you watch it. And then you see this speedboat come out of nowhere and race out to this big crate that was dropped in the water. It's like a cigarette boat. And it grabs that big crate and you see these men through, you know, kind of like these vague silhouettes through the moonlight. And they're dragging this big crate up onto the boat. And then they crank that engine up again and they just take off. Now that's an amazing story, right? And it's a story about like drug smugglers dropping large amounts of cocaine or whatever it is in the Tampa Bay. And then like a, a, a boat coming to get it, right? Well, that's, that's his way of telling me that story. Now, Gene, had, my father-in-law, has an older brother named Jim, and he passed away, sadly, a few years ago. And he told me stories just like that. And it could be the same situations where, like, you know, they would see, like, maybe, like, the, uh, uh, what they call the skunk ape or something like that out there walking along the beach at night. Or, or different, different weird things they would see out there in the dark in the Tampa Bay. And he would tell me all these really fascinating stories. But sometimes what would happen is I could remember a story that Gene told me about growing up on Little Piney Point in the Tampa Bay. And then Jim, his older brother, told me the same story. But do you think they were identical? No. Now, Jim might, Jim might have a different version of the same story. But does that make Gene's version wrong? No. That just means that Jim, his older brother, saw that event from a different perspective and was able to overlay more details on top of the story that Gene had already told me. Now, Jim maybe left out some details that Jim, uh, Gene, sorry, Gene gave me some details that Jim left out and vice versa. And that's how these four gospels are supposed to work. So these four gospels are like these four people who are gathering eyewitness accounts about one person, Yeshua from Netzeret. All right. Now, sometimes Mark will write something based on some eyewitness accounts that he gathered. And Matthew looks at it from this angle and he's like, well, I saw it this way. And it doesn't contradict, but it's adding a different perspective. So there's three of these gospels that we call the synoptic gospels. Does anyone know those three Gospels? So we got four Gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's three that we call synoptic Gospels. In other words, they're like the Gene and Jim Gospels. They agree with each other. And they, compare, they parallel, that they tell the same stories, but from different angles. Does anyone know those three Gospels? 
Matthew's one, Mark and Luke. Three synoptic gospels, okay? John, he's like in a completely different category. And he's the latest gospel. I'm not saying that he makes anything wrong or contradicts it per se, but he's just different. There's a lot of more esoteric kind of qualities to the book of John that was written much later. Well, that, that, that's the idea of the synoptic gospels, okay? That's really important that you understand that. These guys are not contradicting. They're adding different perspectives and shedding different lights on the same story. But let's talk about Mark, the oldest of the synoptic gospels. Now, Mark, was he one of the original 12 disciples of Yeshua? No, he wasn't. He was actually one of the traveling companions of the Apostle Paul. Yeah, his name was John Mark. Most scholars agree that this is the guy who wrote the book of Mark. Now, technically, the book of Mark is an anonymous work, meaning there isn't something in there that says, like, this was written by Mark. But all the early church fathers, all the early historians, they, they all pretty much agree that this was a guy named Mark, and they attribute it to John Mark, who was a Jewish follower of Yeshua, but not one of the original 12. He may have met him. He may have seen him. He may have followed him around for a little while. He may have had firsthand accounts of what he's going to write. But he comes later in the book of Acts and he's named John Mark or Yochanan Mark. So he's probably, a, to a certain extent, a Hellenistic Jew. He has two names, Yochanan and then Mark is his, his Greek name, okay? And that's a very common thing. So it was written, the earliest dating is about 66 AD. Now, when was the temple destroyed? 70. 70. So if that's true, if that dating is correct, that really early dating is correct, He's writing four years before the destruction of the temple. So do you think he's seeing things coming on the horizon? Some, some political tensions that are arising, right? And some rebellions that are starting. 66, 67, we've already got some good Jewish rebellions that are starting. The, the flames of rebellion are already burning in the land of Judea at this time. All right? And he's like, okay, now it's time to write the Gospel of Mark. Now it's time to gather some eyewitness accounts and put pen to paper and tell some stories. All right? And four years later, the temple is destroyed, which is, makes Mark extra unique. If 66, if the dating of 66 is true, that makes Mark the only gospel written pre the destruction of the temple. So he's talking about some things in present tense. All the other gospels would have been written post the destruction of the temple, which if you know anything about Jewish history and the history of our movement, when the temple was destroyed, it was like a... Uh, like a, like a seismic shift, like a polar shift in our movement in terms of like suddenly the, the capital of our movement and the theological epicenter of our movement then shifted to Antioch and Rome away from Jerusalem as soon as that temple was destroyed. All right. So that was huge when we lost the temple. So there's two aspects I want to talk about with Mark that we can divide Mark into. Two, two kind of parallel themes. We have historical elements of Mark. Like when you talk about history, you're just saying, I saw it this way. This is what I saw. Pen on paper, period. That's it. But then the other aspect of Mark is a theological aspect of Mark. So Mark will say things like, look, I saw it happen this way, or other people said it happened this way. Therefore, it's a fulfillment of this, or therefore it means that. There's a theological component to it, okay? Now, this the, uh, the, theological is broken into terms. You're going to hear terms as we go through the book of Mark, like the son of man, or the son of David, or the kingdom of God, okay? Mark's going to kind of sprinkle these terms all throughout his gospel, which are very important terms. And I already mentioned Mark has how many chapters? 16. 16. And we can take these 16 chapters and we could chop them in half. Eight on one side. Eight on the other side. Chapters 1 through 8 are miracles, and then there's actions of Yeshua, and then there's sermons by Yeshua. And then chapters like 8.5 through 16 are like shifting from miracles to now he's going to go to Jerusalem, and he's going to butt heads with the religious leaders in Jerusalem, and then he's going to kind of open up a little bit about his Messiahship, and he's going to teach his disciples what to do after he leaves them. And the, the miracles kind of fizzle out a little bit, chapters eight and a half through 16. 
But one of the most fascinating things before we begin to read, before we open our Bibles and go to Mark 1, is I want to talk to you about these things called demons. Ooh, everybody, look at your neighbor and say, put on your tinfoil hats. <laughs> now, when I read the Gospels, I'm struck by something. And that is about a third of the Gospels and the interaction with the, we could call, unseen realm. Okay, the supernatural, immaterial realm. About a third of those interactions that Yeshua has are, are taking these things called demons, which apparently live in people, and then telling them to get out of people. There's about a third of the, of the interactions. There's 52 instances in the four Gospels where Yeshua tells a demon to leave a person. That's, that's a lot, right? That's significant. And we don't really talk about that very much. I'm like, wait a second. I read Mark 1, the very first miracle, we could say, we want to call it a miracle, or interaction with the unseen realm. Let's say that, okay? Because I don't want to use a lot of Christianese terms with this. But there's an unseen realm. Yeshua interacts with it. The very first instances of the, in the first couple paragraphs of Mark chapter 1, he casts a demon out of a guy. It's like right out the chute. That was his first thing. And it's like, wait a second, why? And how, what is a demon? Number one, what is a demon? And how does it get in people? Right? And if you're a young person and you're like reading this, you're like kind of creeped out. Wait, there's these things called demons and they can get in people? Right? Well, let's, I want to unpackage that a little bit, okay? But before I do, we have to back way up. Way, 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 way up, okay? You remember in Genesis chapter 3, there was a thing called a nachash. What is the nachash? A serpent. A serpent. A serpent. And the serpent joins Adam and Eve in the garden. And he convinces them to break a dietary commandment. What was that? <laughs> not to, not to eat of the the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And he convinces them to break it, right? And you guys know that story. And then in Genesis three fifteen, we're given this promise by God that one day there will come the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman will crush will crush the head of the nachash, the serpent. So we could call this seed of the woman, the snake crusher. That's his title for some reason. And then the rest of the Bible, and especially in the prophets, we get this like, you get various puzzle pieces about what the snake crusher will be like and what he will do and how he will crush the snake's head, right? We call those messianic prophecies. We don't know that that's talking about this thing called the Messiah yet. All right, so Genesis 6, it says that the sons of God looked at the daughters of man and found them beautiful and had children with them. And their children were called, does anyone know? Nephilim. The Nephilim. Now, let's stop here because this is where it gets a little bit weird. All right. I'm just talking about biblical history here, biblical narrative and what, what, how this fleshes out, all right? Now, I'm not telling you to go like check out weird websites with bad Photoshop stuff. Don't, don't do that yet. <laughs> but let's just talk about like linguistically here. The word to fall in Hebrew, it actually is where we get our English word fall. It's nephal, okay? You know, in the Siddur, we read the Amidah. Um, he heals the sick. What does he do? Um, I, can't, I got to say the whole thing. Uh, he supports the falling. He heals the sick. He sets free those in bondage and he keeps faith with those asleep in the dust. Well, if we read it in Hebrew, it's he supports the Nephilim. Oh, wow. But it's not, don't, don't take it literal. It's not what it, that's not what it's saying. He doesn't support the Nephilim. He just supports those who have fallen. Okay? But I'm just showing you that the Hebrew word nephal literally just means to fall down. Okay? Hmm. Nephilim are those who have fallen. Okay? So in the biblical narrative, there are these angels, that we could call them angels, even though I don't, I don't know that's the most correct term. There was like this divine council, okay? And they looked at the daughters of man, had children with them, and they became the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And they became like these warrior kings who then set up their own warrior kingdoms and city-states and ruled over them. And they had this divine wisdom about how to, uh, 
how to cure diseases or how to make instruments of war and how to use plants to enter into the unseen realm and all that stuff, okay? That's, that's, that's kind of what they were doing. And one of the very first times we see this emerge is in the, in the first, like, let's say, Nepha, Nephilim-led city was a city called Babylon. And who founded Babylon? Nimrod. Nimrod. And Nimrod was this great warrior hunter who was a descendant of the Nephilim. And the Nephilim even are around as the, as the Israelites are spying out the land of Canaan. They're, they're called the Anakim. They're descendants of the Nephilim. And they retain some of that genetic ability to grow really big, right? All right. So you tracking so far? You good with me? Okay. I know it's super, getting super weird. Well, these, um, these, these city-states, I'm going to go back, back to my notes here. They're like, um, they're like warrior kings, I said. They're part human. They're part God. And they're filled, like I said, with divine wisdom. But they begin to spread violence and subjugation of the people that they decided to procreate with. It's kind of the theme that we see to develop. Okay? And then Babylon was built by who again? Nimrod. Nimrod. Now, Nimrod is a play on words. And Nimrod, it's a play on the Hebrew um, uh, uh, adjective, rebellious one. Okay? And then the scattering of Babylon happens... And it's like, it's like the decentralization of the Nimrod kingdoms of the Anakim and the ones that subjugate other people with all this divine wisdom. Okay, so be thinking like that, okay? So by the time that the Israelites come out of Egypt, all these little kingdom states are developed and they're led by people who have this passed on divine wisdom, okay? And so that the Anakim, who are descendants of the Nephilim, who are descendants of the fallen ones, when they die, the thought process was their disembodied spirits live on in human beings. Okay? That's what we call in the New Testament unclean spirits. Okay? Now, let me pause here and refer, re refer you to one of the most authoritative scholars on this topic is a man by the name of Dr. Michael Heiser. Have you guys ever heard of him? And he puts out, he does a podcast called The Naked Bible, but also wrote a, a book called Reversing Mount Hermon. And he talks about this, that by the time that Yeshua comes on the scene, this is going through the imagination of the Jewish people, that an unclean spirit is a disembodied spirit of the Anakim, who are descendants of the Nephilim, and they can inhabit the bodies of human beings. They can give them divine wisdom. They can give them supernatural abilities and strengths, but they can also turn them into writhing mess. They can give them what we might call in today's medical terminology a mental illness or something like that, okay? So I wanted to kind of paint that picture. Now, we call them in our English vernacular demons, okay? But demons is, it's a lot is lost in translation. The best Hebrew word to capture this would be se'irim, se'irim. And they are, the, they are specifically the disembodied spirits of the Anakim that would go and inhabit human beings, okay? Now, how many are there of these disembodied spirits, these demons, these Se'arim, do you think? A bunch. A bunch, there is. Yeah, now Hebrews 12 says that there's an innumerable company of them. Innumerable. <laughs> That's a lot, right? And then some would speculate that based on some, some language in the book of Revelation, that a third of the angelic hosts joined Satan in his rebellion, okay? So you got Satan, or really his name isn't Satan, that's more of a title called the adversary, translated as the adversary, but you got Hasatan, the adversary. Then you got under him, we're talking hierarchy now, you got under him the Se'erim, the, the unclean spirits, the demons who are subject to his authority, okay? You got me so far? Now those can go and they can possess human beings and cause them to do things and behave in certain ways that are unholy or oppressive. Because you've got to remember, in the, the thought process, like the, the, the whole theme of these se'arim is to oppress human beings, to subjugate human beings, okay? Just like when they were walking the earth as Nephilim, they would subjugate human beings with their divine wisdom, with their physical strength and their power, okay? Now, when they, they enter a human being, it's the same thing. It's like they are pressing, they're subjugating, they're controlling the human being, okay? You got that picture a little bit more in your mind now? 
So, how do we get to the point, however, where Yeshua comes on the scene and he starts telling these Se'arim, these demons, you, what is your name? Come out of him. And then everyone watching is like, oh, wow, okay, he has the authority to cast out these demons. So do you have a better picture now of what Yeshua was doing? Now let's go back to this title that Mark is going to use before we read Mark called the Son of David. We're going to see this a lot in the book of Mark. Why do you think it's significant that Mark calls him the Son of David? Who was David? He was a king. Yeah. What were the Nephilim? They were like earthly kings that subjugated human beings, that oppressed human beings, right? And used their divine wisdom to do that. And then the son of David comes and he is a king, right? Now, this title, the son of David, is linked directly to the prophetic oracles of Daniel. But also linked to the Davidic line, the royal line of David, right? Now, as you begin to put the mosaic of the messianic prophecies together, about remember the snake crusher, what is he going to be like? What is he going to do? Right? As you begin to put all these pieces together... We see that the prophets say that he has to come from the line of David. That he has to come from that lineage, okay? And that's why M Matthew goes through these great lengths to tie him back to David, okay? Not great lengths, but just make sure that he traces him back to, to David and make sure that he does his homework in that sense. So what I want to ask, though, is what preconditioned the Jews of Mark's time, of Yeshua's time, to know that when Messiah comes, he will cast out a demon? Because it doesn't say that in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, anywhere. That none of the prophets say that when the Messiah comes, when the snake crusher comes, he's going to tell those evil spirits to leave human beings. So what preconditioned them to be like, oh yeah, that's, that was totally expected that the Messiah would do that. That's interesting, right? Yeah, Suzanne, you have a question? Yeah. That was that spoke volumes to the people when they saw the Pharisees not able to drive the demons out and Yeshua was able to drive the demons out. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting. That 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 the rabbinic thought in his time was that when the Messiah came he would have a higher level of authority over these unclean spirits, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah and that's that's very true, yeah. So but where does that begin to develop biblically speaking? We could look at um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance. Um, did you know that there are psalms that were found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are not in our canon of Scripture? And one of these psalms talks about how David performs songs to sing over the possessed. Yeah, it's, it's, it's called, 11, it's, it's called the um, 11Q Scroll. And it says that all those who sang... Uh, um, all these who sang them were th that David composed these psalms under the utterance of the of the spirit, uh, the spirit of prophecy specifically. And this psalm goes on to say that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, a scroll eleven Q. It says, "Let not an evil spirit have dominion over me." So this is attributed to to David being the author of this psalm that was found in the Dead Seas, in the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls. Also. How many psalms are in our Bible? There's only 150, right? Well, did you know in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, there's 151. Did you know that? One gets left off of the Masoretic text. And in that 151st psalm, it says this essentially the same thing. That David has authority over the unclean spirits. And then... Oh, so I'm, I can't see you, Suzanne. I'm sorry. You kind of have to just like say my name or something because it's kind of like silhouetted out there. Go ahead. Yeah. 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 That's that gives credence that there is these songs that would that would um 
have dominion over them. So uh, let's go to Psalm 91 now. Psalm 91. If you have like a phone or a Bible, go to Psalm 91. You've probably heard this before. I know you've heard it before. Psalm 91. Verse 1. You who live in the shelter of the Most High. Now pause there. That right there is saying that, that the, there's, there's high, but then there's the Most High. That's a very authoritative language, right? You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who spend your nights in the shadow of Shaddai, who say to Adonai, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, he will rescue you from the trap of the hunter and from the plague of calamities. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His truth is a shield and a protection. Now pay attention right here, verse 5. You will not fear the terrors of night. Now, if you read that in Hebrew, you would be reading the name of an ancient Mesopotamian demon that came out at night. Or the arrow that flies by day. Now, pause right there. If you were reading that in Hebrew, when you saw that word arrow, you would be reading the name of an ancient Mesopotamian deity. Wow. Or the plague that roams in the dark. Now, pause right there. If you're reading that in the original language, when you saw that word plague, you would be reading the name of the ancient god, the ancient evil spirit that inflicted plagues on people. Okay? Or, yeah, or the scourge that wrecks havoc at noon. Same thing. So, right here, in this verse, we have four names of demons that in the ancient Near Eastern world were thought to affect people in certain ways. So knowing that now, let's go back and read the beginning. You will not fear the terror of night or the arrow that flies by day. Okay, let's go back to verse 1. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who spend your nights in the shadow of El Shaddai, who say to Adonai or Hashem, the, right, the Creator, my refuge and my fortress. And then it goes on, you will not fear this, you will not fear that, you will not be affected by this. In other words, though that demonic unseen realm, those components of oppression that are controlled by those, by those um, disembodied spirits, we should say, they won't, they won't have authority over you, right? Now, this is a psalm of David. So, as the narrative develops, oh, and guys, if you read this in the Septuagint, this psalm in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, it's even more explicitly talking about these various demons if you read it in Greek. It actually calls them by name. It's even more explicit. So, by the time the narrative develops and we get to the times of Messiah, leading up to, as Daniel says, the Messiah, the, the prince has to come before the destruction of the second temple. We're in this golden opportunity, right? There's political tension. There's Roman occupation. If there's going to be a time when the temple gets destroyed, it's now. And that's why the Pharisees, knowing their Bible, say, tell us plainly, are you the Messiah? Are you the son of David that we were promised? In other words, are you the snake crusher? Are you the one that's going to free us from the oppression of these se'erim, these disembodied spirits that are oppressing our people and that are subjugating our people? Are you the one? Right? Let's go to Ephesians 6, verse 12. You know it by heart, Miss Ellen? <laughs> Say it if you know it. I have a son of genius. Go for it. Uh, he's strong and uh, in the power of his might. Whoop. He's strong and out of line in the power of his might. Whoop. On the whole arm of God that you might be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. Uh, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against Power, spiritual witness in high places. And, whew, just, <laughs> yeah, for we, first of all, he says, put on the full armor of God. And he's talking, he's talking allegorically there, right? spiritually there. Put on the full armor of God, right? Because there's like these arrows, right? There's these plagues, there's these terrors. And he says, Paul says, for we are not struggling against human beings, but against the rulers and the authorities 
and cosmic powers governing this darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly, or we could say unseen realm. So, in other words, Paul is saying, you got to know which hill to die on. You got to know that your fight is against the unseen realm, the, the demonic forces that want to oppress us and are constantly looking for a shoe in to do so. All right. I wanted to read that because it's really important. By the time we get to Yeshua, Yeshua is going to express his authority over demons and in essence declaring that he is the snake crusher and that he is the son of David. And we're going to watch him do it in just a second. And by doing so, he's fulfilling Genesis 3.15, that he is the seed of the woman that will crush the head of the serpent. And when he tells a demon to come out of a human being, he's making a very big, bold, theological claim. Uh, I am he. I've got authority as the Davidic king over that unseen realm that wants to do nothing but subjugate human beings. I am here to set free those bounds, to set free those in bondage and keep faith with those that sleep in the dust, right? That's that essence that I'm, it's a, it's a, it's a time of liberty. Proclaim a year of favor unto the Lord, all right? So with all that, all that was just leading up to when we finally get to crack open the book of Mark. You guys ready? The book of Mark. I wanted to lay all that framework so you know what was going on in the imagination of the average Jewish person living in the first century as he's walking on the scene. Very good. That was very good. I'm glad. I'm glad. But uh, just yeah, read um, Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, anything about the unseen realm. He just wrote, put, uh, put out a book, The Unseen Realm or Reversing Herman. Um, that's where I drew a lot of that information from. But um, Mark 1 verse 1. The beginning of the good news of Yeshua, the Messiah. Now, why is it good news? Well, we can look at it from this angle and say it's good news because the son of David has come and he has all authority under heaven, right? He has authority over all that unseen realm. The son of God. It is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare the way before you. The voice of someone crying out in the desert, prepare the way for Adonai and make straight paths for him. So Mark is quoting Isaiah here and saying that there has to be a herald who's going to come and get everybody ready before the son of David comes. Just like a king, uh, 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 before a king rides into a town, a messenger comes into the town, a herald comes into the town, and he blows a trumpet. And he's like, hey guys, the king is coming to your town right now. you got about an hour till he gets here. Get your affairs in order. Clean up the streets, Right? Make the town look a little bit more presentable. Do whatever you got to do because the king's about to ride through this town. Well, that's what Elijah, the prophet, is, is doing here. And, and that's what Isaiah, I should say, is quoting that John the Baptist is doing for Messiah, the king. So it was that Yochanan, John, the immerser, appeared in the desert, proclaiming an immersion involving turning to God from sin in order to be forgiven. People went out to him from all over Yahuda, as did all the inhabitants of Yerushalayim. They were confessing their sins. They were immersed by him in the Yarden. And the Yarden is a river that flows from the Sea of Galilee south to the Dead Sea, okay? And he, um, Yochanan, he wore clothes of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locust and wild honey. So what he's talking about here. Why does Mark bother describing what he's wearing? Why does Mark bother describing what he's eating? What he's trying to say is that this man was not coming from wealth. This man had nothing to gain from turning all these people back to God. This man was living on a very meager budget and he was eating locust and wild honey, both of which are kosher, by the way, and, and quite tasty. But they are a staple in some places in, in, in East Africa, especially in the Middle East as well. But they're kind of a poor man's food as well, though. So he would, he would proclaim, After me is coming someone who's more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. 
I have immersed you in water, but he will immerse you in the Holy Spirit. Shortly thereafter, Yeshua came from Netzeret. Now suddenly Yeshua appears on the scene. Do we have a birth story in Mark? No. Do we have the virgin birth in Mark? No. no. But does Matthew? Yes. So it's a different perspective, right? So he came in the Galil and was immersed in the Yarden by Yochanan. Immediately upon coming out of the water, he saw heaven torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And then a voice came from heaven saying, you are my son whom I love. I am well pleased with you. And immediately the spirit drove him out of the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the adversary. Okay. So what is that supposed to remind us of? The 40 years of Israel wandering in the wilderness, being tempted, right? Being, being, being led astray, being, being led to other gods. So in other words, he's like, I'm going to step back into this period of testing, but from the adversary. Now, who is the adversary? Remember, he's the head honcho guy in charge of all those disembodied spirits that we call demons, right? Now, he's, he's tempting him. And uh, it says he was with him in the 40, uh, 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the adversary. He was in the wil uh, wild. Uh, he was with the wild animals, and the angels took care of him. So notice we don't have the three temptations, do we? We don't. It just cuts right to the chase. After Yochanan had been arrested, Yeshua came to, into the Galil, proclaiming the good news from God. Now the Galil is up north. Okay, that's way up north. And the good news from God. What is the good news from God? This is it. The time has come. God's kingdom is near. Turn to God from your sins and believe the good news. As he walked beside Lake Kinneret, which is the, um, the Sea of Galilee, he saw Shimon and Andrew, Shimon's brother, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Yeshua said to them, Come follow me, and I will make you into fishers of men. Now, do we have the whole thing about throw it on the other side? No, we don't. They're just like, hey, come follow me. So Mark just doesn't have that, but doesn't include that part. At once, they left, going on a little farther. He saw Yaakov ben Zavdai and Yochanan, his brother, in their boat, repairing their nets. So we have four fishermen so far, right? Immediately, he called them, and they left their father Zavdai in the boat with the hired men and went after Yeshua. Now they entered Kafar Nahum, which is um, Caper Capernaum. Now Capernaum is up on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And you can go there to this day. They've uncovered the ancient ruins of Capernaum. And there's actually the ancient synagogue that um, Yeshua would have walked into. You can go to the, those ruins. On top of those ruins, however, is built another synagogue that is in ruins, okay? Um, it is built with this black volcanic basalt rock. And it stands out from the landscape. You can see it from miles away because all the other landscape is white and ashy looking. But you have this beautiful black basalt that they built the synagogue um, uh, here in Capernaum. So he goes into Capernaum, which uh, Kafar Nahum is, it's literally translated as the village of comfort. Okay, Nahum means uh, to comfort, to give rest. All right, um, where do we say this? Uh, uh, never mind, it's a, it's a song, but you guys probably haven't heard it. But Nahum means to give rest, and Kafar is the village of rest, okay? Not, um, this is also maybe uh, like the prophet Nahum, you know? Maybe he has some heritage here or something. And they named the village after him. So it says they entered Khafar Nahum. And on Shabbat, Yeshua went into the synagogue and he began teaching. They were amazed at the way he taught. For he did not instruct them like the Torah teachers, but as one who has authority himself. In their synagogue. Now, do we have any miracles yet? Do we have any kind of like supernatural things going on here. No, this is it. So Mark, here it is. This is the first instance where Yeshua is going to interact with the unseen realm. This is it. Happens in a synagogue. In their synagogue, just then, was a man with an unclean spirit. All right, here it is. It's like they're toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It's like high noon, right? Yeshua, the son of David, the one who has been given all authority under heaven, Right? The one who has authority over the unclean spirits and all the disembodied spirits, the Nephilim and all that stuff that's going on. He walks into the synagogue. And there he's met with a man who's filled with one of those spirits. And that spirit shouts, What do you want with us, Yeshua from Netzeret? Have you come to destroy us? 
I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. But Yeshua rebuked the unclean spirit. He said, be quiet and come out of him. And they were all astounded. And they began to ask each other, what is this? A new teaching. One with authority behind it. He gives orders even to the unclean spirits. And they obey him. And the news about him spread quickly through the whole region of the Galil. So right here, Mark is saying the very first instance, the very first what we could say miracle or supernatural thing going on is Yeshua exerting authority over an unclean spirit. In other words, he's saying, guess what, guys? The Messiah is come. The son of David is here. I have authority over them. Right? Now, we're going to read later. John writes this amazing revelation that he's given by Yeshua in chapters 19 and 20 of this revelation he's given. It's the last book in our Bible. We see that all the, all the powers in the, the, the demonic realm and Satan himself are bound up and thrown into the lake of fire. Isn't that interesting? But in the meantime, in the meantime, Yeshua is sending these ambassadors out saying, look, I give you authority. I give you, you are like streams of living water. Go set the captives free. Go exert your authority over the demonic realm because they have no power over you. Now there's been some nights where I remember as a kid sitting up and wondering, man, could I ever have like a demon? Could I be possessed by that? Or like, is there one in my room with me? Or, you know, you begin to get scared, right? But guess what? If you're a follower of Yeshua, if you've been immersed in the Holy Spirit, then He has authority over you. And the elements of the unseen realm, unclean spirits in the demonic realm, have no authority over you. And you can turn and exert that authority back onto that. And say, in the name of Yeshua of Netzeret, the son of David, I have authority over you. Now, I could tell story after story of, of, of those kinds of instances happening with people that they have told me that I have experienced firsthand, where you exert that authority and you proclaim the name of the son of David, the righteous king, and they, they, legally they have to leave. Legally, they cannot be in that presence. So, fear not. You are children of the Most High. You hide and seek shelter under the wings of El Shaddai. So this world, do you think that these demonic forces have just vanished? No. no. They haven't. They haven't. And what, let's go all the way back to my initial, uh, I guess, source of, of perplexion here. It's like, what, what, um, we see a third of these instances uh, with the interaction with the unseen realm. Yeshua casting out unclean spirits. About a third of them. 52 instances of him casting out an unclean spirit. And it's like, is it done? Is it over? Are we never going to come in contact with that again? Absolutely not. No. They have, been, they have been given authority over this world until their set time for destruction. However, we have been a given authority by the king of kings, right? So, you may come across instances where you brush up against elements of the unseen realm, let's say that. And I just want to encourage you, remind them of their damnation. Remind them of their coming judgment. It exists. I promise. <laughs> Remind them of who gave you your authority over them, and they will flee. All right. Your homework tonight is to read Mark chapter 2 and Mark chapter 3. There's a lot packed in there, and tonight I just wanted to focus on the unseen realm a little bit because we're going to see this reoccurring all throughout the book of Mark where he tells unclean spirits to leave. And I wanted to kind of lay that foundation for you a little bit. And like I said, these unclean things, they've just repackaged themselves in different ways and they present themselves in societies in different ways. But remember, their number one goal is to subjugate and oppress human beings, all right, and gain dominion over human beings, right? But Yeshua's main goal is to set us free, 
from the bondage to sin and death, right? All right. Well, any questions or comments, anything you guys want to add about the book of Mark or anything you want to ask about the book of Mark? I appreciate your attention. I can't see who that is back there, but yeah. I like the way that you have put that all together because you just brought it all together. It's the things I never would have thought of that I could have put them together, but you just brought them all together so that, yes. Oh, cool. Thank you. Oh, well, most of the credit, like I said, goes to people. I'm riding on the shoulders of scholars who have kind of put those pieces together about what was going on. And, and yeah, and so, good. well, thank you. Praise God. Well, yes. Uh, quite oh, I didn't know that. Oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay. Hmm. Kind of so. Yeah, I didn't know that. Oh, man. He's yeah, he is. Any? Yeah, who's back there? Yeah. Well, I can't say with 100% certainty that the Enoch we have today is the Enoch they had back then. I would love for it to be, but yeah, absolutely, the book of Enoch and elements of it were floating around in the imagination of Jewish theologians in the first century. Uh, it, was found, it was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and one of the rabbis sold it to a quote unquote private collector. Yeah. We don't have it. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the book of Enoch is focused on kind of what I just distilled down to you in the unseen realm and where all these unclean spirits came from and all that. Um, but it's a very dense book, and it can take you out in some rabbit trails. I don't recommend you run down just yet, but. Um, I, if you really want to, if you want a good, concise um, package of what I just, um, there's a great lecture by Dr. Michael Heiser on YouTube you can watch, but also the book Reversing Hermon, Mount Hermon. The reason, and basically what he goes into, the reason why the Mount of Transfiguration happened on Mount Hermon um, is, well, you have to read the book, but yeah, there's a lot going on there. He didn't just choose that mountain arbitrarily, but um. All right, any other thoughts or questions about Mark, the book of Mark? Nothing? Well, I hope it, it blessed you and encouraged you, and I'm excited that we conti continue to uh, get these guys up here to teach you about the life and the ministry of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, right? And um, let's close in prayer. And then I think we're going to play some music and dance and sing and, and call it a night. Abba Father, I thank you for your sovereignty and I thank you that you love each one of us and have given us the opportunity to be sealed and protected by your Holy Spirit. And I pray that everything I taught on tonight would be an encouragement and a source of edification for those who heard. And I hope that it brought clarity and not confusion. And may the, the, the words that I spoke tonight, may they spark a zeal in people to, to go and study the book of Mark, to go and study the life of Yeshua. And may we constantly be reminded of, of the authority that was transferred onto us over the dark, unseen realm, the demonic realm. And may we be people of boldness who don't cower and don't stand back in fear the evil that is growing, evidently growing in this world, but we confront it, operating under your spirit and under your authority that you've given to us as your children. And may we all be protected tonight as we run around here and be safe. Thank you so much for the season of joy that you've given to us. Help us to celebrate and rest in your sovereignty and in your goodness and in the shelter of the Most High. Amen. amen. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys.